worthy king we serve. I don't know if you realize what day yesterday was in the Christian calendar, but yesterday was Ascension Day. Yesterday was the day that Jesus Christ ascended as the King of glory, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and I think we need to give our King a great, glorious praise clap offering this morning. Give Him a big shout of praise. Hallelujah, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the ascended one. Not just died, not just buried, not just resurrected, but you are the ascended King. In Jesus' name, we love you, Lord. Amen and amen. Oh, we worship you, Lord. We worship you. Raise your hands for a moment. We worship you, Lord. We usher you in. We usher you in. We usher you in, Lord. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be.
nothing else we want more, God. There's nothing else we want more, God, than to be filled by you, God. No more programs, God. No more programs, God. We just want more. gotta mess us up we don't mind lord send your order to mess up our order lord because we want more of you we want more of you lord. nothing else will do but more of you so we take the time
But when you're praying for people, you know, sometimes it can be a bit hit and miss, hey? But I just feel like we're stepping into a season in our nation where everybody we pray for, that the miraculous, an encounter with God is going to happen. You know, <laughs> you're probably like me, but when I hear about things like that happening in third world countries, and I go, why is it not happening here? I feel like the days are changing, that we're actually going to see what we have desired for so long. But you know, I have this strong sense in my spirit that the key to that is declaring who Jesus is in the midst of infirmity, declaring who he is, lifting up his name so that everything else just becomes demagnified as we magnify his name. So when we sing, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. You may not feel like that this morning. You may feel like, Everything's run out. The bank balance has run out. My health has run out. Well, I believe this morning, let this be a click, a change in the spiritual realm where we, you know what it is? It's us recognizing who we are in Christ. It's us recognizing the inheritance that we have, that Jesus gave to you, that you were worth dying for. Do not let the enemy trick you into thinking that you don't deserve all that he has. So let's just sing that one more time. Your love never fails. Let's just, let's sing it as a declaration of who we are, hey? Would you do that with me one more time? Oh, your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. time.
Why don't you just praise him right now on the count of three. Let's do a big shout. One, two, three. We were. love you, Lord God. You are the centerpiece of our affection this morning, God. It's all about you. comfortable right now, I just want you to just lift up your own song to the Lord, just sing if you don't feel comfortable, you know what to do you just keep singing those words, but just lift up a song to the Lord lift up your own song He loves your song, he loves your song, he loves your 
the beginning and the end. You are the author and the finisher. You are the one who has begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Oh, we magnify your name this morning. You truly are the fairest of 10,000, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. You are the rock of ages. You are truly our King, our King and our Lord. Jesus, 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 we worship you. Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and you fill this atmosphere. We humble ourselves before you, Lord. And we humbly want to say, we love you. We love you. We love you. For you first love us. Amen. Awesome atmosphere. Give him a big hand of praise. Come on, let's just worship him. Give him a big hand of praise and we'll go to this video clip. Thank you. Thanks, Roma. Thank you, team. It was awesome. Audio on the video, we'll show it a little later. And uh, to be honest with you, I kind of feel like it was a God moment because we are here to welcome David McCracken. Of course, many of you know, and he's really a prophetic voice to so many in the body of Christ and travels internationally, really fulfilling that. And so I want us to give David McCracken a great warm welcome. David, come on up and uh, let's go straight into that next session. Where is he? David, there we are. <laughs> come on up, let's give him a big hand. And let's really hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to us this morning through David. You're a blessing. Well, it's a great joy to be with you this morning, and uh, I think it's already pretty obvious what the Lord is actually saying to us, and uh, it's pretty amazing when a speaker can get up and start sharing, knowing that, is this on? Okay, knowing that what has already been, it isn't on. Okay. That's all right. I'll go with these. I'll go with that. Uh, aren't you glad? Jesus actually never had any of this. You know that? Thank you. He actually, aha. Uh -huh. he, he actually, how did he do it? Jesus actually spoke to thousands upon thousands of people and he never had one of these. Doesn't that draw you to the conclusion that Jesus really wasn't a wimp? Amen. 
This, uh, this morning I've been listening to the announcements and, and Brother Sean going on and on about the king and the king, the king. Anybody else hear that? Yeah. And then Roma with her uh, incredible worship leading this morning and going into that prophetic moment when she said that we've got to see him for who he really is. And when I asked the Lord this mo uh, uh, some weeks ago, okay, Lord, this is an incredible subject. What is God saying to the 21st century church? Well, no pressure, but you know. Uh, um, I began to just intercede and say, Father, what do you really want to say? And he said very quickly, very simply to me, I want the church to represent my son for who he really is. And friends, he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. He's not one of many, he's the way. And I think that, for an opener, where the church has got to begin to feel as he evangelically and passionately begin to uh, declare Jesus for who he really is. He's not one of many philosophies. He's the only way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way to the Father. Can you say amen to that? Now, as I was uh, meditating on that, the Lord said, as clear as anything to me, but my son is the king. Now, I know that most of us may know this in our heads, but, and I've known it for 49 years. I've preached it for 46, but I'm telling you now, a few years ago, it went from my head to my heart. And I pray this morning that it will go from our head to our heart, because this morning, Jesus really is the king. And he's the king of kings, he's the lord of lords, he's the one that's been given all power, all dominion, all authority. He's the rightful king and sovereign of this planet earth, and he is the indisputable one to whom every knee must bow. You see, friends, your perception of him determines your representation of him. And if we don't see him as the king, we don't represent him as the king. And I want to ask you this morning, who do you see in the mirror? Because actually, we not only have to have a right perception of him, we have to have a right perception of ourselves. Because if we don't have a right perception of ourselves, we'll never truly accurately represent him. And I want us to see this morning what the scripture says about you and about me and about Jesus. Revelation chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler. You see, above all else, Jesus came to declare the rulership of his father. And he says here, the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he has made us kings, as well as priests under God, his father. So he is the ruler over the kings, and then he explains that we are those kings. You see, Jesus is the supreme king, but we are his delegated kings on the earth. And what I want to show you is that it's been father's intention from the very word go. You see, when Father's intention was first uh, expressed, it was in the Garden of Eden, and he created his son, uh, Adam, and his daughter, Eve, a created son and daughter, not God, but created in his image with his own heartbeat and DNA, and he placed them on the planet to take authority and dominion and to rule and to execute on the earth that which they would hear in the garden. And it worked brilliantly. They would walk together with Father in the cool of the day in the garden and their father would intimately uh, interact with them and his heartbeat would be revealed unto them and then mankind Adam in the Hebrew the he, mankind Adam and Eve would then go and execute on the earth that which they had heard from father in the garden it was all so incredibly simple and father gave them absolute dominion and authority upon the earth and it worked brilliantly. But here was the challenge. You see, so absolute and so unqualified was the authority that Father gave to Adam and Eve in that garden and upon the planet Earth that they actually had the authority to give it away. He made Adam and Eve the legal guardians of the planet, a king and queen, quite literally, of the planet Earth, and then he gave them absolute dominion. And so they had the authority to give it away, and that's exactly what they did. 
Well, as the moment they listened to Satan's advice, they surrendered, they abdicated their authority to him because eventually you bow to whosoever's ad advice you receive. And so the plan never changed, but abdication took place. And do you know, friends, this is confirmed in the book of Luke when Satan is tempting Jesus. He takes Jesus up into a high place and he shows him all the nations of the world. And he says, these have been legally given to me. And now I can give them to whomsoever I wish. Why? Why? Because the legal authority and dominion on the earth, Adam and Eve, had given the planet to him. And so it was legally his. But now God wanted to take it back. God didn't want this uh, planet Earth and mankind to be under the rulership of a satanic influence. And so he wanted to take the planet back. And I don't think there's a single person in this building this morning that disputes that he had the power to do so. God had absolute power, he had absolute dominion, and therefore he could take in, uh, Satan by the scruff of his neck, stack him in a cannon and blast him to Mars. He, With a twinkle of his eyeball, he could have sent him screaming to the far side of the cosmos. But you see, he had a challenge, a dilemma really, because he had given the authority and the dominion of the earth to mankind. You see, mankind was a legal authority on the earth. And so only mankind had the legal authority to take it back. They had the right to abdicate it. They did. They had the right to take it back. They didn't. And so now God wants to bring the whole of this planet back under the, the authority and the dominion of mankind. But not just mankind. Mankind that is fully submitted to the will and intention of the Father. Just like Adam and Eve were in the beginning. Beginning. And so then what does he do? Well, he brings Jesus. But he brings Jesus as a man. Why? Well, because, you see, Jesus had to become as a man, as mankind. The Bible calls him the second Adam. Why? Because only a man could have the legal right to take the planet back. And so Jesus came in his humanity. And friends, I want you to know something this morning. He gloriously did that. He executed that commission. He did take the planet back, but he took it back in his humanity. And in his humanity, he declared that I am now the rightful king of the earth. You see, he destroyed the satanic rule and dominion. He is now, Satan is now a usurper. Our Jesus is now the king. Can somebody say amen? And then he came. And then he said, right, friends, he said to his disciples, now I'm going to sit on the right hand of my father. And so I'm going to pass that royal commission. And I'm going to give that same authority and dominion. I'm going to give it to you. Now I want you to rule here in my stead. And he gave them the commission that the father had given to Adam and Eve in the beginning. And he said, you are now my ambassadors. You are now my delegated kings and queens. You are now those that carry my authority and my dominion. And I want you to take authority and dominion on the earth. And I want you to execute my father's will in this earth just like it is in heaven and I'm telling you friends it worked brilliantly for a short time do you know that Jesus constantly spoke about the kingdom I come he said my father's kingdom come he spoke about his own kingdom he told us to extend the kingdom but friends every time that he used that word he used only ever used one word and that one word comes to us, of course, via the Greek language, the Greek word basileia, and it literally translated means the authority to rule over. And so every time Jesus used the word, he was talking about his rightful legal right as a king to rule over. He said, if I heal the sick, you will know that the kingdom has come. Why? Because my authority over sickness has come. took a few little loaves of fish and fed thousands of people with it. What was actually happening at that moment? Well, the kingdom had come. His authority over natural elements had just been made manifest. The king was expressing his kingdom. 
And he passed that commission on to you and to me. And he passed it on to his disciples. And friends, uh, the church triumphant came into a blaze of glory and authority and dominion in the book of Acts. But friends, we've got to ask ourselves a question, what happened to it? After a few decades of magnificent demonstration of his power and authority, the church got sabotaged and it went into decline. And on one hand, you had a shocking abuse of power, and then you have a pendulum swing. You have a reaction to that, where we don't want any abuse of power. So what happens? Well, they rewrite theology, and they rewrite it to exclude all sorts of things like kingship and dominion and ruling and authority and taking dominion. And instead, they replace it with civility. They replace it with a desperate need to be seen as lowly and humble. And one's claim to spirituality is no longer one's spiritual authority and the miraculous like it was in the book of Acts. Now, now is how poor, how abased, how deprived are you willing to live? And you suddenly a mark of true spirituality is how abased you can possibly become. And so it is today that one of the major stumbling blocks to Jesus being seen in this city, this nation, and this world for who he really, really is, is that we have misunderstood what Jesus said when he said, I come not to be served, but to serve. We have misunderstood that. We have misapplied that. And I felt Father speak very clearly to me and say, you've got to make this one clear. And so I want to make it clear. Do you know that every reference in the New Testament to you or I being servants is descriptive of the relationship that we have with God and with other people. But every uh, uh, reference in the New Testament to us being kings, ruling, ambassadors, taking dominion, having authority, overcomers, etc., is to do with the demonic, with sickness, with poverty, and with every other element on this earth that dares to withstand the will and intention of our Father. You have to see the difference between those two. You see, when Jesus was addressing broken humanity, he was automatically the servant. But when he was addressing the sickness or the demonic in that humanity, he was instantly the king. And he was there to represent the will of his father in relation to every natural force on the earth. He saw them simply as being there to serve the will of his father. He could command fish to go from one side of the boat to the other. He could command a wind and a tempest to stop with one word. Why? Why, friends? Because as Adam and Eve were before him, he was put on this planet to be a son to the father and the king of the earth. He represented his father's kingdom. His authority to rule over. But friends, now we represent his kingdom. His authority to rule over. Now friends, I'm telling you now, Jesus saw no incompatibility with this. He saw no incompatibility whatsoever with having the heart of a servant toward mankind and having the heart of a king towards all that needed to be subdued and brought in line with the will of his father. Friends, we have to come back to the simplicity of the Word of God. You and I are called to walk through this life with a revelation of His fatherhood and our royalty, and without it, we will never accurately represent the Jesus that we claim. And I've got some very, very good news for you. In fact, I'm Irish. Now, that's not the good news. But, but, well, that is good news. But, but, but what I'm about to say to you is good news. And that is that a king is not a king because they're smarter than somebody else. A queen is not a queen because they're more educated than somebody else. A king is a king because they're born a king. A queen is a queen because they're born a queen. 
You see, friends, it's in the seed of their conception. It's in the royal conception that they are made a king and a queen. And according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, it tells us that when we are born again the second time, this time is of his incorruptible seed, the royal seed of the Father. We are born again by the uh, uh, sovereign implanting of the Holy Spirit into our spirit, a literal impregnation takes place. Friends, in that moment, I become his son. I I'm not like a son. I am his son. You're, you're not like a daughter to him. You are his daughter. He now is your father. Why? Because you're born of his Seed. It's an absolute miracle. We can't understand it with our minds, but the Bible is clear. An impregnation takes place in our spirit, and we become his son. We become his daughter. He quite literally becomes our father. And I'm telling you what, friends, when that went from my head to my heart, things began to change for me. How can you ever be intimidated again if you really believe that? Jesus walked on this earth clothed with humility. Yes, clothed with servanthood, but possessing the heart and the authority of a king. Why? Because he was born of his father's royal seed. Scary little statement. Friends, you, me, and Jesus, we have the same father. And friends, the Bible calls him the firstborn of many. In other words, uh, uh, he's the pattern son, the prototype, and if we take a good look at him, we will see him as he really is, and therefore, consequently, we will see ourselves as we really are in his sight and how we are called to live. His authority over the demonic was that of a king. His authority over infirmity was that of a king. His sense of command in the storm was that of a king. You see, his peace and security when people uh, accused him was that of a king. His, his command and authority in the temple when he drove out the evildoers, I'm telling you, that was a king. His dignity when they crucified him was that of a king. He was still in command. His demonstrated power at his resurrection was that of a king. His attitudes, his instincts, his disposition were those of a king. And friends, that's the point. You could put him in a wilderness, you could put him in a carpenter's shop, you could put him in common raiment, and you could put him in a loincloth, but you couldn't change who he was. He was the king, and he's still the king. And if you're born again, You're his son, you're his daughter. Oh, I want you to see this because if you and I are ever to accurately represent him in our world, we must once and for all accept that we are now called to walk on this earth clothed with humanity, sorry, yes, clothed with humanity and servanthood, but possessing the heart, the disposition, the instincts of a king. Now, I'm not preaching that we are all gods not doing that. But I am saying, as Adam and Eve were in the beginning, so are we now. And I am saying, that as Jesus was in his humanity, so are we now. Oh, do you know how liberating this is? I don't have to try to be a king. Uh, I, I tried for a lot of years. I've forgotten the clock. I tried for years. I tried for years and years and years to be good, to be a great Christian, and, and, and to, to, to do it all right. I'm telling you, trying to be good can kill you. One morning you wake up and you realize who you really are, and you realize, I don't have to try to be a king. It doesn't matter how I feel Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. It doesn't matter how I feel Friday night at 9 p.m. I am a king. I can't change that. I was born one of his incorruptible seed. And if you're born again here this morning, so are you. So are you. You getting a hold of this? Oh, friends, we serve the king. We serve the king.
Your representation of him is determined by your perception of him. Your representation of him is determined by your uh, perception of yourself. And I ask you again, who do you see in the mirror? The carpenter or the king? Most people here will have heard of C.S. Lewis. In fact, he was quoted last night or yesterday at some stage. I want to, everybody knows that he was a good author and he, and he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia and they made movies out of it. But I wonder how many have paused to think about the fact that when you read that and really read those novels, you will come to no other conclusion that the Holy Spirit motivated that man to say something in fictional form that could never have been said openly and it's a magnificent demonstration and declaration of the church of Jesus Christ and how they were supposed to be living. And I'll tell you what, it was all about Peter, Edmund, Susan, and Lucy. And I'll tell you what, when you read that story, it is something else. Because in one world, they were school kids. But in the other realm, they were royalty. They were royalty. Do you know, when they, when they, when they first enter into the first volume or the first movie, uh, uh, they come shy, they come timid, they come very apprehensive. They have an orphan mentality like so much of the church in the Western world today. Or oh, they know how to plead, they know how to beg, they know how to even intercede, but they don't know how to declare. If I picked up one thing last night from Dr. Cho and others who, who, who have liked spirit, I know one thing, you have to have a revelation of who you really are. Because you will never have a greater faith. You will never have a greater sense of command. You will never bring the kingdom unless the kingdom is inside of you. And when, those, when, when, they, came, when they came into that first movie, they were just riddled with that orphan mentality. But when they come into the second movie, what's different? Hey, everything's different. The moment they step into that second movie, they're, they're, they're kings, they're queens, they're, they're exercising incredible authority and supernatural things start happening. Well, friends, what puts a difference? It is obvious, if you take a look at that, it is very obvious that they were royalty from the word go. Just like you and me, the moment we're born again. But friends, the difference was when they came into the first movie, they had no revelation of that. And then they had an encounter. Oh, they had an encounter with Aslan, the, the, a prophetic declaration of the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he opened their eyes and he said, and he took, a, he took those orphan uh, rags off their backs and they said, that's not who you really are. And he put a crown of authority upon their heads. And I'll tell you what, from that day on, everything changed in their world. And there was no demon big enough to withstand those school kids because now those school kids knew who they really were. They were kings and queens in the kingdom, the realm of the spirit. And friends, right now you have a dual passport. In this natural world you could be a, a lawyer or a doctor or a laborer or a carpenter. But I'm here to tell you that in the realm of the Spirit with your heavenly passport, you are royalty, you have a command, you have authority. Every demon in hell trembles at the presence of one who knows it. I'll tell you why. There's not a demon in this city that wants you to believe this this morning because if you dare to believe it, you will shatter their kingdom to pieces. <laughs> Friends, what made the difference was they had an encounter. It was a moment of revelation where suddenly they saw themselves as they really were. And I'm going to show that to you right now. But I want you to personalize it. I'm going to close with it, but I want you to personalize it. I want you to visualize, if you like, yourself in that place. And I want you to make a decision in your seat. I am not going to wear that which the enemy has placed upon me. I am not going to wear that which life has placed upon me. There's a poignant little moment that you're about to see where one of them looks down and says, perhaps we have been incorrectly labeled. And friends, I'm here this morning to tell you that you, the church of Jesus Christ, has been incorrectly labeled. You are not who life has told you you are. You are not who 
dejection or rejection or oppression or sickness has told you you are. You are who he says you are. You are who he has made you to be. So let's just take a look together at this little clip now. And then I've got two, one second after that. Professor knew we were coming. Perhaps we've been incorrectly labelled. <laughs> Mrs. McCready? I'm afraid so. Is this it then? Haven't you brought anything else? No, Mum. It's just us. Small favors. Listening Eastern Sea, I give you Queen Lucy, the Valiant. To the great western wood, King Edmund, just. To the radiant southern sun, Queen Susan, the gentle. And to the clear northern sky, I give you King Peter, the magnificent. Once a king or queen of Narnia, always a king or queen. May your wisdom grace us until the stars rain down from the heavens. Long live King Peter! Long live King Edward! Long live King Susan! Long live King Friends, that's the very contrast that exists today between those who know who they really are uh, and those who have accepted what life has told them they are. And I pray this morning that there will come the, a, a trigger this morning that will cause you to wake up differently tomorrow morning and the next morning and the next morning and the next morning. Friends, when you come in touch with broken humanity, you are instantly the servant, the one of love and compassion that truly represents the heart of the Father for that broken humanity. But when you come up against demonic opposition, sickness, poverty, or any other natural element on this earth that dares to withstand the will of the Father in that given moment, you are a king, you are a queen. It rests upon you the authority of the church of Jesus 
Jesus Christ has got to be accepted. When you walk into a hospital or ward, I'm telling you the authority of the king has just entered the door. When you walk into a financial institution, the authority of the king has just walked in the door. When you go into a new city to, or town to plant a church and there's demonic opposition, I'm telling you the king of kings has just strode into that town and he rests on you and friends, the authority you are under determines the authority you carry. And if you are under his authority and his dominion, you carry his authority and his dominion. And I don't want any one of you ever being the devil's football again because this morning we're going to make a declaration that our King Jesus rules in Melbourne, he rules in uh, Australia, and he rules in the earth. And I wonder how many of you here this morning want to wake up tomorrow morning and the next one with an increased revelation of that. I believed it theologically all of my life, but I'm telling you what, just a few years ago, it slipped from my head to my heart. And I wonder whether we could send out a declaration this morning. Because if you're ready to receive a greater revelation of that in your own spirit, so you wake up with it every day of your life, then I'd like you to stand where you are right now. And what... And on the count of three, we're going to declare. Oh, we're going to declare. I know this is going to shatter, shake a little theology, not theology, but philosophy maybe. But we are going to, only going to declare, my Jesus is the king. But then you're going to declare, and I am his ambassador. The authority of my father rests on me. Oh, friends, wake up tomorrow morning knowing you're his son. You are his daughter. You're born of his seed. He's your father. He's not just the father. He's your father. Okay, on the count of three, let's make a declaration. And hey, don't save it for the MCG. Let's make a declaration this morning. In the name of Jesus, one, two, three. Jesus is the king. I am his ambassador. His authority rests on me. Now look somebody in the eyeballs and say, you're a royal blood. You're of royal blood. As I hand over, as I hand over to Brother Sean, just wait a minute. Just as I hand back to Sean, never ever underestimate the power of your confession. And not, you don't wake up and confess how you feel tomorrow or what the devil suggests. You wake up tomorrow morning confessing the truth. Because it's the truth that sets you free. And out, out, there, out there in the foyer, I have a couple of books. And I know that they will empower you to live a victorious, triumphant Christian life. I believe that they will infuse you with that revelation and inspiration of who you really are. And so I trust you'll take a read of those as well. The Lord bless you and have an incredible year ahead of you. Lord bless you. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give David a big hand. I believe that was a word straight from heaven. Come on. Amen. It's time for us to shake off every wrong identity of the devil. Let me make this. You might have been a victim, but you are no longer a victim. Do not allow him to continue to victimize you. You are a son, a daughter of the Most High. Amen. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. We often put that in the context of those that are in places of authority, but I've carried for a long time the conviction that it also speaks of those that he rules and reigns over being us, his children. He is the King of Kings, and he is the Lord of Lords. Amen? Walk in it. David, that was exceptional, brother. That was awesome. Let's just raise our hands. Father, we thank you for this profound truth. Lord, let it not remain merely intellectual knowledge, but I pray, Holy Spirit, that it becomes true revelation 
in our hearts that revolutionizes us to be revolutionary advances of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Lord, your dream is that your kingdom comes right into every sphere of Melbourne, that your will is done as you defined as it is in heaven. Nothing less, nothing less than as your will is in heaven, let it so be on earth. So be in our world, so be in our families, so be in our homes, so be in our schools, in our businesses, in our churches, in our world, Lord. Our cry is, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. As your ambassadors, Lord, continue to anoint us as we advance your kingdom in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Give them a big hand of praise. Come on. Our resurrected, ascended, glorious Lord. Wow. What a privilege and an honor to be on his mission. Well, we have a break right now. So enjoy it. God bless you as you continue to allow yourself to be marinated in this truth and revelation. Oh,